Hello, everybody, and welcome to the very first episode of Thriving in the Margins. That is, Thriving in the Margins. My name is Joseph Lazar, and I'm a freshman student at Bard College in upstate New York, and I'm going to be your host. This podcast is made through the support of Thrive on Kingston, which is a group that works to support local communities and marginalized groups in the Kingston area, uh, particularly people who have been affected by gentrification and other housing and poverty related issues. Um, yeah, and Thrive On, it was started by a group of students here at Bard. So I thought, who better to have as our first guest than the president of the college himself, Leon Botstein. Leon? Uh, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about who you are? Hi, I'm Leon Botstein, and I'm the president of Bard, and um, I'm delighted to um, help get this podcast started and um, uh, give Thrive in the Margins a boost, and uh, so I'll hand it back um, to our host and uh, let him proceed um, as he thinks it should go. Thank you, Leon. So I'd like to start by asking, uh, I know there's a bit of a story behind your name. Uh, would you mind sharing this story with us? I was given the name Leon um, by my parents when I was born. Um, it is the name of um, my grandfather's father, so my great-grandfather was also Leon. Um, and when my mother's older brother was born, the first born in her family, my grandfather named that boy for his father. So he became Leon. Your uncle, that is. My uncle. And um, in the Ashkenazi, Russian, Polish, Jewish community from which I come, the tradition of naming is after family members who are no longer alive. So there is not in that particular, particular social uh, grouping, if you will, uh, there was no habit of naming someone after a living person. So there was no um, Henry Ford the Fourth or Henry Ford the Fifth. I mean, people didn't name children after their parents or a living relative. So when my uncle was born, uh, my great grandfather had already died. When I was born, my uncle Leon, my mother's older brother, was also not alive. He was killed in April of 1943, um, right um, around the um, uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto. And he was killed by the Germans um, in, uh, at, the, yeah, at the close of the Warsaw Ghetto. And um, so when I was born after the war, um, my parents named me for my uncle. My uncle was, in a way, his memory was an inspiring part of my growing up. His portrait hung in our house. Um, he was an organic chemist, did his dissertation at the ETH, the MIT of, of Europe in Switzerland on dyes. He was interested in color dye, dyes, and fabric, and synthetic fabrics, and color, and the chemistry of color. He was an organic chemist. And um, <clears throat> uh, he was also, by all accounts, an extremely um, idealistic and uh, uh, curious and gifted individual. Um, with a deep love of music and um, a real talent in languages and uh, everyone liked him. He was uh, extremely popular and was uh, played a heroic and courageous role in helping 
the few members of the family to survive. Um, between the years of 1939 and the end of the war, I mean 1945, what he did in 43 was uh, permit his younger brother and his parents to go into hiding and survive the destruction of the Warsaw Ghetto. So he was regarded in our family as a kind of heroic and saintly person. It was a little bit of a burden for me because his parents survived the ghetto and camp and uh, I spent a lot of time with them they died in their late 90s and I was very attached to them but for my grandmother for example it was very hard to see me bear the name of her son who was killed so um, it was not without its um, uh significant echoes um, uh, I think we all grew up my brother and sister and I um, my father was the only survivor in his family and my mother uh, a member of a very small remnant of family members that survived and so so you have to understand that uh, the Jewish community from which my parents came 90% of them were killed. So when the city in which they went to school, secondary school, high school, was finally liberated by the Soviet army, um, out of 200,000 Jews in that city, only 900 were left. And 10,000 others around the surrounding European uh, region. So out of 200,000 Jews from that city alone, by the census of that city, um, my parents, and my grandparents and my one uncle, that's five people, constituted five out of a total group of 10,900 people from a larger group of 200,000. So uh, the survival was kind of a miracle, and we were fully aware of that miracle. And that placed uh, a real framework, if you will. I don't. I wouldn't view it as a burden. It's just the the birthright, if you will, that everybody gets. It's the 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 deck of cards, if you will, that's dealt to you at birth, for which you have no control. And um, it has always, um, we're sitting in my office, uh, and there's a portrait of him uh, on the table behind me. Um, so then that's something that um, the name has um, had uh, a lot of significance in, um, in my life. When I was very young, you know, I think we all imagined what he was really like. We, you know, he was certainly someone about whom myths grew over time. That, that was an amazing story. Thank you very much. So clearly you and your family were deeply affected by this hatred towards Jews in Europe. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you've dealt with this? One of the things I think is, is, is helpful is that one accepts the things one can't change as things um, that one wouldn't want to change. I've never wished that I would be something that I wasn't, uh, like the deck of cards I was handed by birth uh, were different. I never wish them were different. They're richer in a way than I've ever reason to expect. So Part of that deck of cards is the significance of that Jewish identity. It shaped our entire history. My parents would not have gone to medical school in Switzerland were it not for the anti-Semitism of Polish laws in limiting access by Jews to Polish universities in the 1930s. Um, 
my parents wouldn't be in modern Poland were it not for the rampant anti-Semitism in the Tsarist Empire before the Bolshevik Revolution. We would never have come to America were it not for the anti-Semitism and our Jewish identity expressed by the Swiss in the 40s and early 50s in refusing to grant my parents and our Swiss citizenship, we came to America stateless. So our identity as Jews uh, was far and away the most defining historical factor in the wandering and arrival of the family in this country. And um, um, the Holocaust and the uh, annihilation of European Jewry um, between 1933 and 1945 um, was the overwhelming historical presence in our childhood growing up in New York. Um, 90% of the people who came through our home were emigres and refugees whose primary language wasn't English. And um, uh, and the deep gratitude that community had to America and its capacity to grant citizenship to these exiles and refugees uh, was extremely high. My older brother, uh, the first to go to elementary school, I mean, he already was in elementary school, um, you know, had to carry the American flag in the weekly assembly because he was the only foreign-born kid in his public school. I was the only foreign-born kid in my class in public elementary school. So um, we were trotted out as, as um, an example of America's immigrant history of immigration which is why I've always been a defender of the openness of the United States to immigration. So one of these immigrants that you know is a guy by the name of George Soros. Is that correct? So I'm just curious, what is, what is your relationship with George Soros? First and foremost, I, I uh, consider George Soros a friend. Uh, we met um, in the 1980s as a result of a program that Bard had bringing artists and scholars out of uh, countries where there was no freedom of expression. And this is while the Iron Curtain was still up. And we brought, uh, we led a consortium of institutions that brought not famous people, but younger scholars and artists. Uh, they came from Burma, then called Burma, um, China, and Eastern Europe. One of the first was a, a Hungarian dissident named Miklos Harashti who wrote a book called The Velvet Prison <clears throat> had been imprisoned under the communists actually had a daughter who finally graduated here and came here twice or three times and taught for a year in any event after the fall of communism he came here and um, somehow uh, Mr. Soros got wind of this initiative and which had been initially funded by the Ford Foundation in the 80s. And um, so through Bob Bernstein, who was uh, one of the founders of Helsinki Watch, um, who was a mutual friend, I got to know Mr. Soros. So since that time, um, I've uh, worked with his philanthropies uh, directed at um, 
uh, his commitment to uh, something he calls Open Society, which is borrowed from a book by Karl Popper called The Open Society and Its Enemies, which is um, a long philosophical historical critique of, of absolute orthodoxies, um, such as fascism and communism. In any event, um, so I've gotten to know um, him uh, through this um, common effort. And um, after the fall of communism, he turned his attention very extensively to higher education, to education as an instrument of improving fairness, equity, freedom, um, and uh, the dignity of the individual internationally and the protection of minorities such as the Roma in, in Europe or the Rohingya in Myanmar. Uh, and so I have remained um, um, active in his ever-increasing philanthropies. And um, it's through him that we were able to expand our own international work. And it was he who gave the first real kickoff grant to allow the Bard Prison Initiative to flourish. He participated with the Gates Foundation to get our Bard high schools off the ground. And the Clementi program, which is a program for education of adults, poor adults, was also spearheaded by his philanthropy. So over the years, he has been a prominent backer of the overlap between our mission as an institution of higher education and the issues of social justice or equity. So that's how I know him. Uh, uh, and uh, when he started a university in 1991 in Europe, the Central European University, after the fall of communism, um, he asked me to be on the board of that, and I've remained on the board of that, and I've succeeded him as chair of that board of trustees, a uh, position I still hold. So the Open Society uh, University Network that you mentioned, you announced this this uh, organization at the World Economic Forum. Is that correct? So wh what's it like at the World Economic Forum, you know, meeting all these influential, powerful people, you know, just casually running into them? Do you regularly attend? What's it like? I'd never been to the World Economic Forum, uh, and I only went because Mr. Soros intended to announce the creation of Austin and the support of it with a uh, one-time grant of a billion dollars over time. And um, so it was a major announcement. He wanted to introduce me as the first chancellor. That's why I went there. Um, I mean, it's... I... I um, It's a kind of gathering of people who want to be seen with the rich and famous and powerful. Um, I've harbored many ambitions, but that's not one of them. So I found it um, awkward and uh, not to my taste. Um, but I was in, you know, a ski lodge with friends and colleagues from the Open Society Foundation. I knew people, uh, walked around the streets, you know, uh, uh, went into uh, simple, you know, restaurants, have a meal with friends. Um, and then at the earliest opportunity, uh, went back to Zurich where I was born and then flew home. Uh, so there was nothing 
to me, particularly glamorous. There was a glamorous side which I never saw. So uh, one heard there were daily bulletins about famous people giving concerts and uh, famous people arriving and uh, a lot of press attention. That all went on somewhere in the in the ski village um, beyond my sight. I was too busy. We were spending the time. Uh, discussing also with varying people who were there. So it had a con- convenience of a meeting place of people that came from uh, South Asia, uh, came from uh, Latin America, and from Europe, and from the United States. Um, and it was a month, two months really, before the outbreak of the pandemic. Uh, there was already some sort of residual background noise of a uh, of a pandemic uh, uh, potentially on the horizon. You became a college president at the age of 23. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah. Um, so let's say I want to become a college president, you know, four or five years down the road. How, how would you suggest that me or any of the listeners go about doing such a thing? Uh, yes, uh, I became a college president at 23, but I became president of a place that was in bankruptcy and was an experimental institution that um, was uh, being harassed politically by a very conservative governor in New Hampshire and that Dartmouth College, then led by a brilliant Hungarian uh, mathematician of Jewish extraction, John Kemeny, the inventor of BASIC, the computer language, and uh, student of Einstein's, John Kemeny, as president of Dartmouth, believed it was in Dartmouth's interest, as a very powerful and rich institution, to protect this fledgling college which had been created in 1964 and went into bankruptcy, bankruptcy in 1968 from closing. So, um, and Dartmouth dominated the board of trustees of the small, there were 90 students in the semester before I arrived. So it it, it sounds very grand, it wasn't very grand, um, and I did nothing to deserve it. I was just in the right place at the right time when lightning struck. It was no achievement, and one of the virtues of that early start is I have never deluded myself that I deserved this opportunity. Um, Two, many people thought it was a disaster. Most of my advisors advised me not to take it because this was an institution without status or prestige, hanging on uh, for dear life, um, and looked down upon by all other institutions. So it was like a joke um, to many. So it was, most people make careers by following a set path. Uh, You go to the best college, and by someone's definition of best college, then you go to the best professional graduate school. Then in each of the professions, you step on a golden ladder, you know, you... um, if you're in law school, you clerk if you can for the Supreme Court, then you uh, get high government job or you um, join the faculty of a major law school or you begin to work for a big, um, you know, uh, top-notch law firm and then make partner. They're kind of set patterns. In my case, um, my primary ambition was to be a musician and um uh, there was no real set pattern for that, um, and I I never followed a predetermined path. I mean, I I I I took made sharp turns um, based on no particular calculation, but a sense of the moment. So, if you wanted to become I never thought of being a college president. It never occurred to me in a million years. And I didn't harbor this dream. I did harbor a dream as a child, uh, as a young adolescent of being a musician. That I did. But not but not of being a college president. I never gave it any thought. Um, 
until someone asked me whether I'd be interested in doing it, the person who asked me was uh, a Lutheran pastor uh, who was um, at Dartmouth, and uh, Paul Raymar, who was uh, the chaplain of Dartmouth. And um, so I, um, I learned on the job, and... Um, uh, there were more disadvantages than advantages for being very young. And um, having spent five years there, I got asked to come to Bard, um, where I've been since then. Uh, but I've never had the ambition to be a college president, nor would I be were I no longer at Bard. In other words, what I'm saying is that um, once I got to Bard, I realized that, you know, Leading and building Bard was of great interest to me. I became very attached to trying to do a good job doing that. But I was never tempted to be president of some other place. That that didn't interest me. What interested me, of course, is that Bard has been very good to me. Um, and that was possible because of the people I work for but also because of its um, deep historic connection to the arts uh, and to music. So it was a um, very welcome home. And I think that uh, I, um, having emigrated as a very small child to the United States and from a family that has been on the run, if you will, or refugees, or homeless, that I intuitively wanted to create some sense of stability and continuity, which is why I was never attracted to the idea of moving around from one job to the next. So you're obviously a very busy man. You have a lot of a lot of projects and programs going on. You run the college, and apart from that, you also teach. I, you know, we we met before. I went to to your first year seminar class that you lectured, and you you teach in the in the conservatory. So, what's uh, what's the most exciting thing that that you do, and what's the most exciting thing about about being an educator? So teaching is at the core of why we exist. So it seems to me an obligation. It's possible. It's not always possible, as you know, um, my schedule and the obligations I have, which um, derive from the job I have, uh, make it very hard to be consistently available, um, which is why I always teach with a colleague, so the students are not disadvantaged at all if I can't show up. Um, but um, the conservatory teaching is a little bit easier because it's all in the evening, which is a little better for me. Um, <clears throat> So rehearsals are in the evening, except we're very close to performance. Um, and um, But there, you know, we have guests so that <clears throat> I'm not uh, responsible for every <coughs> concert the, um, let's say, the conservatory orchestra does or tone does. But it seems to me that if you're responsible for an institution... Um, you have to remain active in what the institution is all about, and teaching is what the institution is all about. Though that's the most enjoyable and most important activity. And the second most important activity is, is the second most important thing such institutions exist for, and that is research and scholarship and advancing the understanding or the limits of knowledge, right? So um, I pursue that in my own field as well. That's so the two primary obligations of a faculty member here are teaching and work in one's field. So apart from teaching, um, the second highest obligation is uh, to continue 
had some presence. So I do that uh, through writing and scholar in my own field. So I'm doing a book uh, for Yale uh, in the era of music history, for example, and I edit a scholarly journal that's published by Oxford. And then I do some performing and recording. Um, and the third thing, uh, which is unique to my position, is the oversight on the running of the college. And from a student's point of view, and the faculty's point of view, and the external world's point of view, that's the most important obligation I have, because it's unique to the office. I put the other ones first because they spiritually or substantively enable me to do the third. In other words, I am not in favor of the professionalization of administration. That is to say, I think hospitals should be run by doctors and engineering firms by engineers and, um, and um, architects by architects. And colleges by professors. And colleges, right, by people who are doing what the thing is organized to do. Um, uh, and therefore, if you're talking to a student or to a faculty member, the two primary constituents of your work, you have to have an empathetic understanding for what they do. So... Um, and you can't have done it only 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Now, it, it's not always possible to make that arrangement, but I have been very lucky um, that uh, with the help and support of the trustees in the community, I've been able to continue that balance between those three things. All right. Well, we've been talking for almost an hour and a half. So just one last question. If you have any kind of insights or wisdom that you'd like to share with our listeners in the world, anything you think that people should take away from this, now's your chance to share it. Uh, so I don't have any unique uh, bit of wisdom. The only thing I would say to listeners is that the stance uh, toward life ought to be one that is framed by optimism, by the uh, capacity for human beings to to make things better and to um, uh, to make some let's call it ethical and moral progress in the conduct of life and the way we treat one another. Pessimism is the easiest way to display intelligence. Um, you know, everything ultimately disintegrates. You can appeal to the second law of thermodynamics. Um, a pessimist is always ultimately right the sun will ultimately go down. We all are mortal. But, um, and there is a kind of useless, glib optimism, you know, preachy, um, rosy-colored view of the world. Uh, but I think, without being unrealistic, it is possible to construct a sense of optimism and uh, courage, to that one can chip away um, at varying degrees of impact on what's wrong with the world, whether it be issues of climate or issues of equity or <clears throat> and um, that um, it's like a a never-ending prize fight in a, in a and you're always being knocked about by your opponent uh, and uh, even knocked down but the trick is to get up and not to lose the confidence that one can actually um, make a difference and um, take pride in what one does so that, that's the one thing I would I would um, um, sort of the 
the capacity to start over all the time um, and um, shake off the disappointments and failures that inevitably um, come along with um, trying to achieve what one wants to achieve. Well, that was an excellent way to end this. Leon, thank you very much. Thank you, for doing this. Uh, thank you very much for doing this, and good luck with it. I appreciate it. Thanks again. All right, to our dear listeners, uh, I hope you have enjoyed our first episode of Thriving in the Margins. If you like this episode, please share it around, tell other people about it, and I hope you will join us next time. Thank you very much.